Have you ever had an experience that totally changed your mind about something? Maybe you ended up becoming friends with somebody that you didn't think you'd like, or you fell in love with that person who you thought was your total opposite. Now, I've had a ton of experiences like that in seminary where I thought I knew something for sure without a doubt, only to find out I was wrong or I just didn't know at all. And today we'll read another more serious and dramatic conversion story of the Apostle Paul, who wrote much of our New Testament. I'd like to start our teaching time today by offering a prayer for us. And so if you would, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessing today as we study your word together. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we might read scripture and hear your message for us today. Open our hearts and our minds and allow us to apply your words to our lives and let them change us from the inside out. I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week, we left off our story of us with the early church as recorded in the book of Acts. If you were able to worship with us last week, you'll remember that the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were both written by Luke, who was a Gentile physician that converted to Christianity and became a missionary companion of the Apostle Paul. Many of the details that are recorded in the book of Acts are also mentioned later in Paul's letters. And I said last week that external evidence for the accuracy of Acts is more extensive than for any other book in the New Testament. So most scholars consider it a historical document that teaches us about the early church. Last week we read after Pentecost, the first Christians were living together in a large group, probably just outside the city on a large plot of land. And everyone sold their property and gave it to the apostles to take care of the group of believers. Now, as you can imagine, with a large, diverse group of people that were all living together, the apostles have to deal with a lot of different issues. They get complaints of favoritism and neglect of certain people and responsibilities. And understandably, they feel torn in a lot of different directions. So as we've seen in other places in scripture, they decide to appoint seven people to be the administrators of the group. They're the first deacons. We'll see in a minute that these deacons do more than just administration. They preach and evangelize, but their primary job was to care for the body of believers. One of the first people appointed as a deacon is a man named Stephen, who Luke says was full of grace and power, and who, who did great wonders and signs among the people. Acts 6 says that his face was like an angel. Now, I'm not sure if that means he was good looking or he had charisma and presence, but Luke says he was an incredible preacher and was filled with the Holy Spirit. The religious leaders in the city don't like this newfound power of Stephen and they put together false witnesses to have him arrested. And then he is eventually stoned to death by an angry mob. One of the religious leaders who's present as Stephen dies is a young man named Saul. Luke tells us Saul approves of this killing and goes on to kick off a wave of severe persecution of the church. Acts chapter 8 says Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off both men and women and committing them to prison. Now with the benefit of hindsight, we tend to point our fingers at Saul for his persecution. We forget that he's a man who, just like the early Christians, was all in for his faith. Saul was a man who was born to a devout Jewish family, and they were from the influential trade city of Tarsus. Tarsus is located in modern-day Turkey on the Mediterranean Sea, and he was born around the same time as Jesus, maybe a few years later. When he was young, scholars agreed that Saul was sent to Jerusalem to study at the school of Gamaliel, who was a Pharisee doctor of Jewish law, who was held in great esteem in Jewish tradition. It would have been an honor to attend. Now, Paul didn't choose to become a professional rabbi, but instead he was an artisan. He was involved in leather crafting or in tent making, we believe. And he was committed to his faith deeply. He was incredibly devout and proud of his Jewish heritage. Later on in a letter to the Philippians, Paul writes that he was circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. 
In other words, he had every conceivable advantage under the law. He loved God and he wanted to protect the holiness of Yahweh who commands that we worship no other gods. So when this man, Jesus of Nazareth, gathers a group of followers and tells them that he is God, Saul cannot allow this false teaching to stand. He'll do whatever it takes to shut down this group of radicals. And so this is the background leading up to our text for today, and it sets the stage for the dramatic conversion of Saul to Christianity. Now, this passage is one that requires us to suspend belief for a few moments. It's a supernatural encounter. If we read Acts as a historical document, though, we have to be willing to accept that God does some pretty incredible things in those days of the early church. Yahweh, the God who created the universe and then sent his son to earth to die on a cross and then raises him from the dead, does sometimes use supernatural events to get our attention. And I think if anybody does, Saul needs to be shaken a little by the shoulders. And so with this in mind, friends, let's read together from Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, that is, the way of Jesus, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Luke goes on to tell us that immediately after this, Saul gets up and begins preaching in the synagogues. Understandably, the people are like, wait a minute, isn't this the guy who was just persecuting the Christians? He's on our side now? Now, a common misconception that we have is that Saul's name was changed at the time of his conversion. But when Jesus enters and appears to Saul on the road to Damascus, he says, Saul, Saul, in the Hebrew tongue. He doesn't actually start using his Greek name, which is Paul, until later in the New Testament. And so rather than being a result of conversion, as some believe, many scholars think Paul chooses to use his Greek name in order to put people more at ease. I can imagine that Saul's previous reputation caused many, caused many to fear him and probably doubt his authenticity. Earlier in the scripture, God calls Ananias to be the one who gets to restore Saul. And it's obvious that he's confused and scared. He says, Lord, I've heard from many about this man and much evil he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. Ananias could have chosen to ignore God or to run away, but he does what God tells him. He shows incredible faith in this story. 
Imagine how it must have felt for the Christians who had suffered direct persecution from Paul. All of a sudden they find out he's on their side and they're supposed to work with him and help him and feed him. It must have been an incredibly awkward and difficult situation. But see, dealing with the awkward and the difficult are sometimes exactly what God calls us to as we work through what it means to be a body of believers, a community of people who live together, who forgive one another, and who work through the awkward and difficult situations. When we read stories in scripture of forgiveness for people like the adulterous woman or for Peter who denies Jesus, we want them to be restored. We're rooting for them. It's much harder for me to forgive someone like Saul. But this conversion story reminds us that Saul, just like Peter, just like the adulterous woman, just like you and me, we are all pursued by a God who never abandons anyone. We're called to forgive one another and continue working together for God's mission in the world. Saul is a proud man who's humbled, brought low, and through repentance is restored to fullness of life. God wants nothing less for you and for me. Now, later as Paul, Saul will go on to be one of the most influential people in all of history. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, anywhere from 7 to 14 were written by Paul. Scholars don't agree about the exact number, but you get the idea. God uses him in incredible ways. His writing and teaching have shaped our faith over the past 2,000 years. Now, I couldn't preach this sermon without saying that Paul does go on to write some of the most controversial teachings in all of Scripture, many of which deal with women and slaves. We could talk about all kinds of things like context and divine authorship here, a whole host of theological terms, but I'm not going to dive into that today. Instead, I find myself in awe of the never-ending love of God that is central in the passage that we read today and the forgiveness that God requires of us to extend to one another no matter the past wrongs. I don't know about you, but I know how hard it is to forgive another person, but it's even more difficult to forgive myself when I've messed up. I can't imagine what it must have been like for Paul to realize how many people he had tortured, imprisoned, and even killed in the name of Jesus. In a deeply personal letter to his mentee, Timothy, Paul wrote, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. I feel those words deeply in my soul when I read them. I know what it's like to realize how much you've been forgiven. Despite all of the sins and the times I've failed to live up to God's holy calling on my life, Jesus chose to die on the cross for your sins and for mine. And the love that we receive from the God who pursues us is without end. It's truly amazing grace and it's changed my life. If you're hearing this today and you don't know what I'm talking about, I would love for you to find me today. Send me a text message or an email and we can have a conversation. I lived many years in shame and sadness because I didn't know what it was like to be set free in the love of God. God doesn't want that for any of us. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and that is you and that is me. If you're hearing this today and you do know what I'm talking about, I challenge you to remember that feeling of forgiveness and be bold like Paul in your faith. Tell somebody else how God's grace has changed your life. Now, many of us aren't going to encounter nearly the amount of risk that those early Christians had to deal with, but our mission is the same. We're told to go and make disciples. And so today, my friend, my prayer for us as the body of believers is that we will step into that mission just like the early church did. That we'll tell our friends, our neighbors, and everybody we meet that God loves them without end. Tell them how you have experienced forgiveness and grace and how God has changed your life and how He longs to change their lives too. It's my prayer for you and it's my prayer for me. Amen.